All right, it's a green light I see. All right, I'm good. All right, hey, welcome everyone again. Um, my name is Kenneth Tan. I'm the Executive Director of Personalized Learning and Assessment for Curriculum Associates. Um, it's a long title. Ultimately, I am one of the people, whenever you have questions related to assessments, how to use our data for a variety of purposes like per personalized learning, um, how to look at the data after a, a particular diagnostic. I am the person who works with districts across the country on how to do that. So we're going to cover a couple of things today. One is going to talk a little bit about like, why do we need to assess, right? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, what are the different measures within iReady and what matters. And more importantly, we're going to go into iReady ourselves and take a look at how we can look at data after our second diagnostic, because I think a lot of you have already finished that right, right now. Um, so I hear this comment over and over again. I was actually on a call with a district in California who said the exact same thing to me, right? So why do we need to use data? Our kids are doing relatively well, right? They're performing better than the district, av the district average or the, or the state average. Why do we need to use data? And more importantly, when I grew up, when I was teaching, when I was um, going to school, we never used data. We didn't have this much testing. Right. So um, maybe I'm of certain age, but when I remember going to school, we used to paint our houses with lead and we know better. So we don't do the same thing anymore. Right. Um, when I grew up, I think we used to like ride our bicycles without helmets. Right. We don't do that anymore. And maybe I'm really dating myself, but there used to be a time when we used to treat all medical conditions with leeches. Right. <laughs> we don't do this anymore because we know better. Right. But extending this medical example, I can't imagine being a parent because I have two kids and taking them to the doctor. Right. Every year on their physical and say and saying to them, look, yeah, your kids look OK. Right. They don't need, we don't need to do anything with them, but we're not going to do any kind of testing or um, um, anyone's in their 40s. Just around those personal. Right? Imagine if you the doctor says, hey, you and I are similar age. We're going to do the exact same. We're going to treat you the same way. Right. Without, I have no idea without doing a test whether or not my blood pressure is high or your blood pressure is high. Right. So we know we know this for our own personal use. We need the data to really personalize medicine, personalize the treatments that we use. The same is true in education. Right. So um, there's a quote from Jim that was done in Ed Week a couple of weeks ago. Actually, a couple of weeks ago, back in July. So James Popham is a professor of emeritus at UCLA. Uh, pretty well known researcher. And he really thought about, he talked about this article in the sense that um, assessment literacy is a low cost way of improving schools. Right? So just think about that for a second. We spend a lot of time testing kids. It's all about what do we do with that information that's going to drive performance, right? So how do I know that assessment literacy or what even is assessment literacy? So I think about assessment literacy as being able to explain the purpose of the test that we use, being able to match the assessment for specific uses, be able to make appropriate inferences based upon the data that we have, um, being able to have good assessment practices, in getting the data and then more importantly how do i even communicate those results to parents or the various stakeholders so if we can drive or improve our assessment literacy like we know the test we know what are the inferences that we can make from the test being able to use that data to drive instruction right and be able to communicate that broadly to all the stakeholders it's a good way to improve schools how do i know that because um, one of the schools that we work with is down in miami-dade and we wrote a white paper about that. Um, so Miami is um, like, is, so Miami's or Florida's accountability model is similar to North Carolina in the sense that every single school gets a letter grade. A is the best, F is the, F is the worst. So two years ago, Miami hit a significant accomplishment. For the first time ever, they actually have no F schools. Right. So if you think back to the graph, in 1999, they had 26. In 2017, they had zero. A lot of that they attribute to having a strong data culture. They're using the data to drive instructions. Um, the other thing that they do in the state of Florida is that every single district gets a letter grade. A is the best, F is the worst. And for the first time ever, last year, Miami received um, and A rated. So they're rated A for the first time. They have no F, and then for the second year in a row, they have no F schools. So you think back to the James Popham quote where assessment literacy, being able to use assessment data to drive instruction, uh, be able to communicate that to people is a low cost way of improving our schools. And I would say Miami is just evident of that. It's not just, um, so, 
wrote Miami, there's, I see this in other places. So the assessment director in Miami is Gisela Fields. So when I asked her about like, what is it about their data culture? This is what they say. A strong data culture exposes information to everyone, giving them notice and putting them on alert. They are more aware of everything that's going on and they know how they can take action. So it's not about assessment, it's not about just testing kids. It's about using that data to do something with it. Right? Identify what are the strengths of those students and what they are ready to learn next. So in North Carolina, you also have letter grades. So over a weekend, a couple of months ago, I actually did this calculation where I looked at all the schools that we work with in North Carolina, about 500 of them. Um, and, and looking at their letter grades from a couple of years ago to last year, 106 of them actually moved one or more letter grades, so about 25% in my base, or 20% based upon my calculations. Um, a letter grade change is 15 points, right? Um, 376 schools, about 75% of the schools actually moved half a letter grade. So it's not just Miami, it's other districts in the state of North Carolina. We actually had a user event um, a couple of days ago, and the superintendent from Vance County was actually presenting, and they're also seeing significant changes as well like this. And a lot of they are also attributing to having a strong data culture and being able to use the data effectively. Right? So um, a lot of the work that we do is really informed by research. Um, one of the studies that we did a couple of years ago was what we called a high flyer analysis. So in our, a high flyer analysis is this. We work with about 6 million students across the country, a lot of districts. We wanted to identify, we can measure growth because we have a vertical scale. We want to identify the schools that got really good growth and what are the characteristics of those schools that got really good growth. And ultimately, it came down to these five characteristics. Right, um, Vance would actually point to the number one. So they really feel it's important that leaders are important. So Vance County has a very big emphasis on leaders. Same thing Miami Dade. So on the schools that we see as having really um, good growth or our high flyers, they have strong leaders who are champion of change. They make growth the predominant measure of success. So they're not just looking at the performance; they're looking at growth. The reason why they look at growth is because growth is a leading indicator of proficiency. If we can get kids to grow faster, we're going to close that gap. Right? Um, schools that have a really, who are high flyers have a strong data culture. Miami, Vance, and many other places across the country that we work with. Right? When we think about a strong data culture, this is what we mean. Data is used at all the different levels. So in these high flyers, they have data chats with their students on a regular basis. Teachers have data chats with their students. Teachers get together with other teachers and they look at the data. Principals have data chats with their teachers and superintendents or district leaders will have data chats with their principals. They use it at every single level. Um, when I think about it, a strong data culture, it's also about like embracing the data as ours. So I know that a lot of districts, when they're first new to iReady, they always question the data, which is perfectly acceptable. Right? But to a point, you have to get to a point where you just accept the information and this is our data. Because if this is our data and we own it, what we can then do is use that information to set goals for ourselves, right? What are the areas that we seem to struggle with? And if we recognize that this is the area, we're actually going to do something about it and identify metrics to determine whether or not we're making progress. And then in strong data cultures, they use that data and they engage in a cycle of inquiry. All a cycle of inquiry is simply this. They look at the data to identify a particular area of need, a problem, a practice. They collaborate with other teachers to identify why are we struggling in teaching kids third grade numbers in operation in that particular area. They identify specific strategies that they're going to take, specific standards they're going to identify that they're going to try to reteach or pre-teach. They go off and change their instructional practices, collect the data, if they're making progress, they move on to the next area. So in schools that have a really strong data culture, they engage in this cycle of inquiry. Um, they use that data to deploy resources, coaches, experts, you know, what are the classrooms or the grade levels that have, um, who need the greatest support, 
they go to go through that and i'll go through an exercise with you later on so that you can find that yourself within your schools and then the last thing that we see with our high flyers is this um, intentional and very structured approach to remediation using a variety of tools right so one of the districts um, that we work with is manatee county down in south florida um, one of the schools is tillman elementary and tillman a couple of years ago went from an f to a b in one year and in talking with the principal, what is it they attribute it to? So they went from an F to B in a year. As part of our comprehensive curriculum plan, we infused many of the iReady tools in second through fifth grade. Students work on both our ready materials, which is what's called in Florida, maths and laughs. During our standard reading hour, both iReady online and ready materials are used for differentiated instruction, as well as standards-based learning and comprehension instruction. So what they do is they actually um, regroup whole grade levels. So that rather than treat all kids the same, they're actually going to take all the kids who I may get all the kids who are one grade level below and Robin will get all the kids who are two levels below within a particular area. And by having them work at the same level, we can really differentiate and really target their specific um, needs or what they're ready to learn next. Okay. Um, it's not just places like Miami that has a strong data culture. Teachers say they want to use data. So there was a survey that was done by the Educational Data Quality Campaign. And in that survey, they surveyed parents and teachers uh, and they asked them about data. So 86% of the teachers resp or respondents say, I think using data is an important part of being an effective teacher. 82% students benefit when my instruction is informed by data. Right. Um, this chief academic officer in Miami um, talks a lot about they want teachers to be artists of the craft. They don't want to spend their time disaggregating the data. They just want them to look at the information. And one of the things that we've done with iReady is made that even easier for you. So we have brand new reports that we've redesigned to make it really obvious where are these needs or what kids are ready to learn next, right? We want them to help them use their time to differentiate and not analyze the data. Right. Um, a couple more findings from that survey. 67% of the teachers use that data to reflect and improve on teaching practices. 62% of the teachers want to communicate with students about their strengths and learning needs. So in places like Miami, Vance County, that's almost 100% where they're doing these data chats on a very regular basis. And then um, once again, it's higher percentage in these higher flyer districts where 61% um, collaborate with t other teachers to support student learning. It's much higher in Vance, much higher in all our high flyer districts. So it's not just our research, there's other findings that collaborate um, what we're seeing. What's interesting to me is that I don't know what the opt-out movement is like in North Carolina. Um, I know that I used to live in Georgia, that was pretty high. Florida's um, also pretty high. Where parents say the, is, um, say the following. When you ask them about the value of data, 95 of the respondents say they want to use that data to support teachers' use to make sure that their students are getting the support they need. And it's an increase from 90%. So nine, almost 100% of the respondents say it's really important for teachers to use the data to help my child improve. Yet these same parents are really focused on like not having their kids take tests. You can't do one without the other, right? But there's a reason why they're so up in arms against it, right? Back to this notion of assessment literacy. How often do we actually just send kids home with the test results and we never tell them like what was the test? What are they, what does that tell my student, tell me about my students and what should they work on next? So the more we can change that, that, that last bullet point around effectively communicate results to stakeholders, if we can improve our ability to do so, we can get parents on board with testing. They know the value of it because we're using that information to guide instruction. Right. So iReady um, provides you with a lot of information. So I know some of you are somewhat familiar with it, some of you are not, but so I'll just take a step back. So iReady starts off as an adaptive diagnostic. So we get students will receive questions at their current grade level, and if they get the question right, they'll get a more challenging one. If they get the question wrong, they'll get a slightly easier one. It will adapt up and down across the various domains until we can determine where you are, and then we would denote that in terms in the form of a scale score. A score of 525 has no meaning to most people, 
like except for me or other assessment folks. And what, what we do is we take that 525 and we interpret it and let you know what a 525 means in terms of what grade level the child is working at. We take that same 525 and we run it through a regression formula in order to tell you what's the student's probability of being proficient on the North Carolina EOG at the end of the year. And we call that predictive proficiency. We also take that 525 and we compare that against other kids across the country to tell you how that student is performing relative to the peers, right? And that's a national percentile rank. So one of the questions that I get the most often is this one. How do you know that a 525 means a student is at a particular grade level? The reason why there's a lot of confusion is because there are two ways of doing it, right? You can do that through a norm or you can do it through a criteria. So what does this graph look like to most people? A bell curve, right? So when you use on a norm reference test, this is what they are doing. They are looking for the average, and if you have the same score as the average, you're considered on grade level. Um, depending on your exp experience, you may either think this is great or not. I know that, for example, my first exposure to a bell curve was in university, where some of my courses I was graded on a curve. If you never had that pleasure, let me explain how that works to you, right? What they are doing is they are finding the, the, the professor is finding the average for the class. If you have the same score as the average, you're a B. If you have a score above the average, you're an A. A score below the average, you're a C or really far down, right? Um, I remember one exam that I took and this really influenced my thinking. I think I got like an 89 on that final. But rather than thinking that I would get an A in the course, I actually got a B. The class average was 90, right? So if I had a criteria where 80 or higher was an A, I would have gotten a better grade. But because we're using the average, I don't get that, right? So norms are really good if you want to rank order students. It doesn't work if you want to understand where kids are relative to the standards. But a lot of this is influenced by our traditional way of thinking, right? So there's a book that um, a number of us have read. I'm not sure if anyone has seen it. Um, it's called The End of Average by Todd Rose. Um, so Todd is a professor at the Graduate School of Education. Um, Todd um, is, has a really interesting life story. Um, he actually, he's a high school dropout. He was getting D's in, in high school. And what he recognized was that um, just high school wasn't for him. So he dropped out, and it wasn't until he actually um, figured out the best way for him to learn, personalized instruction for him, did he go back, re-enroll in high school, got his GED, went to undergrad, and then he graduated with a doctorate from Harvard. So he's teaching at the university now, and he's trying to change our mindset as it relates to the average. Um, so I don't have, if I can't get the, the computer work, I probably don't have audio either. So there's a TED talk that he did a um, couple, like last year, actually maybe two years ago, around this notion of why the average has failed us in different areas. It's okay, I can, I can narrate it. So, um, so the, the example that he cites the most often was the U.S. Air Force. They may have heard this one already, right? So back in the 50s, the Air Force had a problem. They couldn't figure out why their planes were crashing. So they thought initially it was the pilots, right? We always blame the people. But when they examined the maneuvers these pilots were doing, it was not pilot error or pilot training. Um, there was nothing mechanical wrong with the planes, per se, in the sense that the engines were not stalling. There wasn't an issue with um, the, with the controls. Ultimately, they realized the issue was the cockpit. So this is the 40s and the 50s. And to be a pilot, you had to be a certain height, a certain size dimension. So there was a lot of standardization that was occurring. So the Air Force had the design challenge. Was, so if you have our pods a certain size, how do I design one cockpit that fits the most number of pilots? So you think back to a bell curve, right? Where do most people fall within? They fall within the middle. So their thought was, why don't we just design the cockpits to fit the average pilot? Most of our pilots are certain dimensions, right? They're all the same size. Um, why don't we just use the average? So with that in mind, they thought maybe pilots are a little bit taller now, heavier. So let's go off and redesign the cockpits with new averages. Um, so they measured all the pilots that they had across these different dimensions of size, height, reach, and so on. 
Um, however, there was a researcher who wanted to ask this really simple question. How many pilots were average on all the dimensions? I gave it away, but in essence, it was zero. Right? So what they realized is that they were designing these cockpits to fit nobody. Right. So we do the exact same thing in education. So I used to teach, I used to teach fifth grade. And if you asked me back in the day um, how I design my lessons, I will tell you, I'm designing my lessons for the average student within my class or that middle student. You ask your teachers today, they probably will tell you the exact same thing because we're so ingrained in thinking about the average, right? Um, so what we're trying to move away from, and so this is what Todd's mission is. He wants us to focus on the individual. We really want to understand where kids are, what they know, and what they're ready to learn next, and use that knowledge to drive instruction, because that's how you learn, right? So let's, rather than teach the one lesson for all kids, why don't we differentiate a bit more, right? When we differentiate a bit more, we saw examples from that um, Tillman Elementary where they focused on differentiation, they get really good data, really good outcomes. <laughs> So the reason why the average doesn't work is that people have a jagged profile. So these two individuals on the right-hand side look exactly the same if you were to distill them on a single dimension of size. The reason why that's the case is because you can be tall with short arms or short with long arms. There is no standardization of people. Right? There is no standardization of students either, and I'll explain that in a second. So the, ultimately, the Air Force learned the following lessons, right? Anything designed around the average is basically doomed to fail. What we need to do instead is design around the attributes of the individual, change the environment to fit the individuals, right, um, or the standards. So this is how the Air Force solved the problem. Rather than designing the cockpits for the average pilot, because there was no average, they measured their pilots to figure out who's the tallest and the shortest on all the dimensions of like size, right? And they built sliding controls or sliding seats. So you and I can drive our cars without changing our seats. However, if someone who is taller than us was in the car previously, they're going to really reach to hit the pedals. They're not going to drive it as well. The same is set can be true for education. So rather than designing our lessons around the average, could we design our lessons based upon what the standard is calling for? And if we have data about where kids are, uh, for the kids who are below level, maybe I scaffold that lesson so that kids can access that standard. For the students who are working above grade level, could I design extension activities? So we're taking that to heart in a lot of things that we're doing. So what we're trying to do with iReady is to use that information to help you identify what are the prerequisites that kids need to have within a particular program. Um, and we've actually embedded that into our new math program. I won't talk about that, but we're trying to take a leverage that data about the kids to know for, if I'm going to teach a lesson on adding, subtracting fractions, could I find the kids who are ready for that? find the kids who are below grade level and I need to pre-teach or think about what are the prerequisite skills and address that first. And if I do that and I personalize instruction to where kids are, I'm going to be a lot more successful in helping kids reach grade level standards. Okay. So uh, the reason why students also have this jagged profile. So I could take a look at two students and if I were to distill them on a single dimension of grade level, they would look exactly the same. However, as you can see, one student is on grade level in high frequency words, another one is above grade level in that same domain. You can go into your data right now, look at a class report, sort by the overall domain, and you start looking at the colors, you'll start seeing a lot of variation, right? And that's because students develop, or people, develop at different rates, right? And we just can't treat them as the average, right? So we take a different approach. We don't use the norm or the average to determine where kids are, what, the, what is where kids should be. We use the criteria. So the method that we use is a process called standard setting. So in standard setting is simply this. We get teachers together and we ask them to think about their students and their standards. In standard setting, um, I would have sat in on a fifth grade standard setting panel because I would in working with other teachers across the country um, at the same grade level, they would ask us to create achievement level descriptors. Basically, what kids should know and be able to do at an early understanding of the standards, a late under, mid, mid understanding of the standards, and a late understanding of the standards. Once we create the criteria, the next thing that they would ask us to do 
is find the students because we know them are best in our class that we believe have met the requirements for early but not mid mid but not late and late not above grade level so create the criteria based upon the standards find the students who met the criteria and then afterwards we will look at their scores in looking at their scores we have noticed that all the kids who were identified as being early grade level have a scale score range of 581 to 608 everyone who's identified as mid 609 to 629 everyone who's identified as late 630 to 640 so create the criteria based upon the standards find the students who met the criteria look at the scores and that's how we determine our placement tables and that's what that's the process when you look at iReady and we're telling you that students either early mid or late or one or two grade levels below that's the method that we utilize okay uh, we'll do some optimization of the cut scores so there's no overlaps but ultimately when we say a student is early grade level it means that they have only partially met the expectations of the new standards and i would consider the student to be like beginning understanding um, a student who has reached mid grade level had met the minimum expectations based upon the standards and we would consider these students to be proficient so you can think of mid grade level as being proficient right late is a high bar late means that you have met or exceeded grade level expectations and if you are late or advanced you can do one of two things you can either um, deepen your understanding of your grade level content or work on the next grade level above right because you have already met or exceeded every single standard so partly it's our fault um, it's very technical the language that we use in early mid or late a lot of educators are very confused by the early mid or late because a lot of educators believe that at the end of the year the students have to score late on grade level and that's not the case if you can get to mid on grade level any time during the year you are considered proficient right not just proficient in terms of your state test well how do i know that is because we actually do these linking studies right um, so one of the linking studies that we've done is between students who've taken three i ready diagnostics and the north carolina end of grade assessment at the end of the year right so they take both tests and in doing so we can look at the correlations between the two tests and as you can see, the correlations are relatively high, 0.83, 8.3, 8.2, and so on, right? Um, there's a yellow, that's red line. So groups like the Center for RTI, they use a threshold of 0.7. So anything above a 0.7 means that these two tests are highly correlated to one another. That means if you, do, if you score low on iReady, you're going to score low on the North Carolina EOG high on i ready you'll score high on the eog right so if i know that there's a strong relationship between the two tests the next thing that i can do is i can go off and use that information to create a prediction model so if i can i can use my prediction model and i would have predicted based upon our study that 59 percent of the students in the fall would be proficient on the eog in third grade um, it was 59 in the winter, 59 in the spring. The actual observe was 58%. So we have the ability to predict how kids are likely to do um, if you need that information. It's only one piece of information, right? It's just one data point predictions, right? Placements are much more useful um, as well as norms. But if I know that these two tests are related to one another, the other thing, and I can predict, the other thing I can do is I can crosswalk the tables, the scores. The, what we do is we go through a process called equi percentile linking and in looking at the students who scored in the first percentile in third grade reading what is our i ready scale score what is the e north carolina eog scale score at the first percentile second percentile third percentile i work my way all the way up and by doing so i can take a score on one scale and i can tell you what the equivalent score is on the other scale Right? And by doing so, I can create this rain, what we call internally a rainbow color chart. So this is simply telling you what is the I ready scale score in the spring that a student should be at in order to be at the various levels on EOG. So if I'm a student in third grade reading and I have a scale score in I ready of 530 to 541, that is comparable to scoring a level three on EOG. 
The way we found that out is because we looked at what is the scale score on EOG for level three. We worked backwards based upon this linking in order to determine what that score on EOG happens to be on the iReady scale, right? I'll, and I'll make these slides available to you afterwards. Um, so I'm going to you know, preface everything I say with the following, likely. So just because a student scores um, 530 on iReady in the spring, I'm not going to guarantee that they're going to be a level three on EOG. There's a couple of reasons why. When I think about a student, what's going to happen is they're gonna, they may have a greater motivation to take one test, less motivation to take another one. But when I look at the, um, a lot of kids across the, over time, those differences kind of average themselves out. And this is just the mathematical relationship between one scale to the other. I'm not looking for kids getting them to 530. I may want to get them ab above the bar a bit more. Uh, but this, if you want to know what is the iReady scale score for a particular level, this is it. Right. If you, I know you heard me talk about the early, mid, or late. So if you want to know where the relationship between our cut scores for our placements, early, that's purple, green is mid. Where do you think level three happens to be, which is your proficiency cut? Somewhere in between early and mid, right? Um, and that's true. So if you can get kids to being, um, to score er, mid grade level, this green line, they are higher than what they need to be in order to be level three or proficient on North Carolina EOG. So without even looking at predictive proficiency, you can use that placement information to tell you where you want kids to be at. Now, it's not exactly the same. If I, in third grade for math, if I can get kids to being early, they're actually at just slightly below where they need to be for a level three. Um, if you want to know where level four happens to be, that's where the red line would come in. So if I can get kids to being mid on grade level within iReady, once again, any time during the year, they are scoring mathematically um, higher than what they need to be to be a level four. Right? This is level five. So all I've done is I've just taken my rainbow color table, look at the cut scores for our placements, find the lower part of the range, and just plot on the line. Okay. <laughs> um, so if I can get kids to be higher than mid grade level, that's level five. But when I talked about late being a high bar, this is what I mean by that. So I know it kind of gets washed out in the lights, but you see that dotted blue line? That's late. So if I can get a student to score late on grade level, they are scoring higher than what they need to be to be a level five, which is the highest performance category in North Carolina. Any questions at all about this? Okay. Um, so this is math. I know we have some reading people here. This is what the, this is what the results look like for reading, right? So purple is early, green is mid. Um, that solid blue line is level three. What do you notice about that solid blue line that's different than uh, math? It's below early, right? Except for grades three. Right. So generally, this pattern holds true not just for North Carolina, but Florida, um, districts that you, or states that use Smarter Balance or PAR or Georgia or many other states that we've done these linkings. So if you can get kids to early grade level in grades four, five, and so on, you are scoring technically higher than what you need to be to be a level three in reading, right? Um, by the way, I don't tell your teachers to aim for early. I tell your teachers to use mid grade level. The reason why I'm always aiming for mid is a slightly more conservative estimate, and it gives me the greatest cushion possible. However, as an instructional coach or as your principals, as you watch us later on, if I see that uh, within my school, I have say 20% of my kids placing mid on grade level, in fourth grade, but I had 50% of my kids who are placing early, right? I don't panic so much because I know that in fourth grade, the actual performance will probably be more on that upper end of that range, that 50, not so much on that 20, that lower end, right? It's going to be between early and mid, and it's going to be closer to early in fourth grade, 
And then the math is going to be closer to like the mid level. It's going to vary a little bit. So that's level three. So that's tracks a lot to early to our early. This is level um, five in our late category. So what I always find is interesting is this is once again similar to every single state. If you can score late grade level in reading, you actually are slightly below what you need to be for a level five on the state test. And this kind of explains why there's so few kids who score late or it's going to level five in many states, right? It's generally high bar. And the other thing that they've done is you look at the spread between like the solid lines, that's a big gap, right? Like they put three and four relatively close together, five is a big jump. Right. So this is just a long, I just want to use this time to help you understand um, the relationship between iReady and your state test, your accountabilities. I just want you to know that you can trust the data. If iReady is telling you that kids are not going to do well, they're probably not going to do well on the EOG. However, we actually have time to do something about it. Right. So um, just to do a quick recap, we create these achievement level descriptors across all the different um, domains in reading and math. I know it's kind of hard to see, so I'll blow it up. So early sixth grade students should have a solid foundation working within a set of whole numbers and can apply them in a variety of context. They are beginning to reason with rational numbers, using them to explore ratio and rate, recognize the relationship between positive and negative integers, and so on. Right. So this is the um, diagnostic results report for a student who scored early grade level, sixth grade, within that domain. Um, if you look at their next steps for instruction, I know it's hard to read in the back. It says things like solve problems involving unit rate, solve problems using ratio and rate reasoning. This language is very much related to what you see here, and it's by design. So if a student is scoring early sixth grade, well, what do I need to do in order to get that child to score mid sixth grade? Why don't we look at the achievement level descriptors, the criteria for mid sixth grade, rewrite that as a set of skills, think about where those skills fall within a learning progression, put them on the report for educators to follow. And if I can get my students to achieve these next steps, they are very likely to move to that next performance category because this is the criteria for the next performance category. So it's a bit of a circular logic behind that, right? So this is the criteria for mid, right? How do I get a child to mid? Look at the criteria. It's fundamentally different than some of the norm reference tests that you may have used in the past, where you are on grade level because you scored at the 50th percentile. You want to be above, you need to score at the 75th or 80th percentile. Beyond scoring 25 to 30 percentage points higher, it's not really clear. They may have, a, a, I'm not sure what program your assessment you're using before, but sometimes they have a really long list of recommendations. The reason why they're long list is because they don't have that criteria to inform what kids should be working on. But what we're about at Curriculum Associates, it's not about like assessing kids and telling you where they are. It's about giving you the resources to do something about it. So if I were to click on that little um, plus sign, sign, it's going to pull up various resources. And one of the resources is this tools for instruction. And one of the ways to help kids visualize, um, to solve problems involving user, user, unit rate, is to visualize what a unit rate happens to be. So we have these lesson plans, these tools for instruction for all those skills that we identify that student is ready to learn next. Right. So um, I spent a bit of time talking about the different data points within iReady. So we've talked about the grade level placements. We talked about the predictions and how they came, how they're related to North Carolina. We talked briefly about norms, the reason why, um, how we are able to take a score and compare that against other kids. We're going to talk about growth next. Because growth is a really important factor. So schools that have really good growth or are high flyers focus on growth predominantly, and that's a, how they measure their success. So um, we'll go through this exercise in a second, but I want to give, give you an overview. So when we think about growth or we think about students, I like to think about students from two dimensions. So one dimension is performance, which is the um, horizontal, and growth is the vertical, right? Or, or the EY. So ideally, I think we would all agree, we would want all our students to be in quadrant one. These are the students who are above the national median in terms of performance, and they have high growth. If I can't be in quadrant one, I would want to be in quadrant four or quadrant two. 
Four means that you have high proficiency, but low growth. Two is the opposite. I have high growth, but low proficiency. So quick show of hands, who wants to be in two? There's no wrong or right answer. So who wants to be in four? Right. And there's no wrong, right or wrong answer because it really depends on the context. So if I'm looking from an accountability model, I want to be in four, right? I want my kids to be high proficiency. And if it's growth, is not very low. That's someone else's problem technically, right? Um, two is something that I would honestly, what I would want to focus in on is identify the kids who are maybe below, but if I can make sure that they're growing fast, they're going to close that achievement gap because growth is a leading indicator of proficiency. Um, three, I think we would all agree that you don't want to be there, right? You're low proficiency and low growth. And the reason why I really want to emphasize four in terms of growth is that if I can't get these kids to grow faster, whatever head start that they came into my class with, it will slowly erode and they're going to slowly regress into quadrant three. So I'm going to take you through an exercise in about 10 minutes on how to do this, how to look at your data to determine where kids are across these dimensions. But before that, I want to just give you a bit of an overview around what we mean by growth and what's our growth model. So we're taking a different approach to growth, right? So rather than treating all kids exactly the same in third grade, we're differentiating it. So what I mean by that is um, there are two students in my example, Alex and Bianca. Alex is a student who is two grade levels below. So in essence, they're coming into the class at a first grade level. Bianca is com coming to the class at a thoroughly third grade, right? So they're different. So rather than treat Alex and Bianca the same, what we did is we found all the kids like Alex across the country. So come on, 100,000 students who started third grade at a first grade level. We looked historically at how much growth they made over the course of a year from fall to spring. And then we looked at, we picked the middle point, the median. And kids like Alex over the course of a year will grow 27 scale score points over the course of a year. And that's what we would consider typical growth, right? <coughs> Bianca scoring at a higher level. But kids like Bianca, who scored at an early start of the year at an early on grade level, they score 25. So they're not the same number anymore. Alex is 27, Bianca is 25. And that's what we call typical growth. You notice how we have this blue column? That's what we call stretch growth. So stretch growth is designed to put a student who is behind on a path to proficiency. And it's designed to put a student who is on grade level on a path to advanced proficiency. The way we know that these kids are on the right path is we found the students who actually achieved it. Right? So imagine if I looked, looked at the couple hundred thousand kids like Alex, and we found a subset, maybe like 50,000 students. These are made up numbers, but right order of magnitude. Who were behind and within a couple of years caught up to grade level. In looking at the growth trajectory of that student, what we wanted to know is how much did they grow in that first year? And those students who reached proficiency grew 43 scale score points within that first year. So the idea is this. We're creating, um, I think the Vance County Superintendent, or Dr. Jackson, uses GPS analogy. We're giving you the guidepost to follow. If I can get a child to grow 43 like Alex, they're on that right path to proficiency. And for kids like Bianca, they got to grow 34 in order to reach advanced proficiency. And you can see how based upon the graphic, how they're getting closer to that green, that mid grade level or higher. Right? So just to recap, typical growth is the uh, median amount of growth of kids like you. And then stretch growth is our recommendation on putting a student on a path to proficiency and advanced proficiency. Right? So we think of this as being a lot more equitable than before. Um, so you think about this notion of equality and equity, they're slightly different. Equality means we give all kids the same thing. Equity means we give kids what they need in order to be successful. Right? Our model is a lot more equitable because rather than give all kids the same goal of 30, we are differentiating it based upon the starting point. So if you're three levels below, it's 36. If you're on grade level, it's 17. Right? Um, I know the table is kind of hard to read, but there's two things I'll point out to you. One is in kindergarten, if you're um, 
on grade level is 43, early 44, and one level below is 49. This is reading. If I'm in fifth grade, it's 7, 13, 16, 20, and 26. So some of your teachers may talk to one another because they're teaching different grades, and they may say this to you. Hey, it seems really unfair to those kindergarten and first grade teachers because their typical growth goals is so much bigger. Why is it the case that the kids in fifth grade are not growing so much? All kids grow. However, we want to think about the following. Um, anyone teach like elementary reading? How many words do kids learn in kindergarten and first grade? Is that more? Yes, because I saw someone big this you know, sign of wide. A lot more words than they learn in fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade. So that difference in terms of the volume is reflected within our scale. That is why kindergarten has much larger typical growth measures than you do at the upper grades. But keep in mind that every one of these numbers is fair. It's equitable. It means that kids have the equal opportunity to reach seven because we found other kids who are in fifth grade on grade level and we saw that they grew seven scale score points over the course of a year. The other thing I'll point out is the further behind you are, the larger the number is. So if I'm in third, fourth grade, typical growth is 28. If I'm on level, it's 12. So we don't expect kids who are already on grade level to grow at the same rate as someone who's really far behind. And that's reflected within our model, right? Uh, this is the same numbers in math, same pattern holds true. Smaller numbers, upper grades, bigger, lower grades, right? Bigger, um, the further behind you are. So stretch growth is our recommendation to put a child who is behind on a path to proficiency or on grade level advanced proficiency. Um, these are aspirational but achievable goals for every single student. The way we found it is we, as I mentioned, looked at the growth of millions of students, uh, found the students who were behind but caught up or on grade level or moved up, and then we wanted to figure out how much growth they made in that first year. And in order to make that amount of growth reasonable or attainable, we capped it at the, 90, at the 80th percentile. So I can have a child like Alex who is in third grade placing at a first grade level and they caught up over a couple of over years and they may have grown 99 scale score points within the first year that may represent or 100 that may represent the 99th percentile of growth so we didn't want to set the 99th percentile of growth because only one percent of the kids would actually achieve it so we capped it at the 80th percentile for two reasons one yes 20 percent or more of the kids can actually achieve it but secondly, it puts kids on a path to proficiency within three or so years. We can lower it to like the 70th or 60th percentile, but that means the path to proficiency could be five, six years, and we may not have that time. Right? So a three-year horizon is what we're aiming for. Right? So if you want to know what, typical, what the horizon happens to be or the path, this graph, graphic would show you. So let's think about a student in third grade. That student in math on the diagnostic scored three levels below. Stretch growth for them is 55. You see it's purple. That 55 corresponds to a three plus year path to proficiency. Assuming that student is now moved in from fifth grade to fourth grade, and they're taking the diagnostic in the fall, and they've grown, they've achieved that 55, and they're now two levels below, stretch growth for them is going to be 41 scale score points. So I'm just basically reading diagonally, and that's a two-year path to proficiency. Let's say that student moves from fourth grade to fifth grade. They take the diagnostic again in the fall. They are placing one level below. Stretch growth for them is going to be 31. And if they can achieve the 55, 41, and 31 in three consecutive years, at the end of that last year, they would be proficient. They in essence are scoring mid or higher. So it's not going to be for every single student like this pattern, but we have it more detailed within iReady. I know that some districts used to create their own custom growth goals where they looked at, hey, I have some kids who are behind. Let's set a goal of one and a half years worth of growth. It may actually not be enough relative to where they should be. So we have a model that's a bit more precise, and it's based upon the evidence. Find the kids who are behind but caught up and look at how much growth they made over time and use that as a way, as a mile marker for other people to follow. Right. So just in thinking about the goals, it's a great goal for it. So stretch growth is a great goal for kids, 
but it should not be the only goal. As a teacher, I want to know two things. Are students growing as expected, which is typical, and are they growing enough to close the gap or move up? And that's what Stretch tells me. Right? We want as many kids reaching that as possible, but if you don't have all the kids reaching it, it's okay. Right? When we look at the data, just randomly select a couple of districts, we found about 25 to 35% of the students actually achieve stretch. So I'm not saying all kids are going to get there. It's really about what are we doing differently in order to help kids grow more. Right? Um, so just to recap, I like to think about stretch as the following. It helps you catch up. I use the term over and over again. We actually thought about using this within the, within the program or move up. So if I am behind, stretch growth will help me catch up. If I am reaching um, stretch, if I'm on grade level, it'll help me move up. If you want a term for typical growth, think of it as keeping up. If I reach typical growth, I'm keeping up with my peers. Um, depending on where you are, how you place, keeping up may be good, it may be bad. Right? So if I'm really far behind, keeping up maintains where I am. If I'm two grade levels below, I will maintain being two grade levels below. Right? Um, but at least I'm not losing ground. So if I can't get kids to reach typical growth, that's what our goal is. We want all kids to reach typical growth because it's, it's possible for them, right? Um, and we want most of our kids to reach, as many kids as possible to reach stretch. So let me talk about how we can do that in a second. So um, I would have you just turn and talk to your partner and just um, what are a couple of key takeaways for you? Like what's a question that you may have as a follow-up? So let's take two minutes um, and just turn and talk to your partners. And I will hand out this or we will hand this out while you're talking. Do I just pass this out to them? Two pages. Sure. They're all standards. So we looked at um, primarily Common Core. So technically, what we did is we um, looked at all the standards from things like NCTM, NC. It used to be like I feel the reading ones, not IRA, but we looked at those skills. We abstracted that. We looked at the Common Core and all the major standards and we abstracted that from the perspective of what are the skills and that's what yep <laughs> sure yep yeah I, it's like ironically because so, so i had the exact same i was talking to this district of california yesterday and the principals had the exact same issue the teachers were discounting like the results right and um so i have a perfect example that they seem to resonate with them so i'll, I'll talk about that in a second um and then if you just hand out like two color cue cards to people does it matter what color like i, I don't have enough so a couple of cards for you like green and orange or green or yellow if you want to <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, if I could get one's attention again. So anyone willing to share what one uh, of the key um, takeaways that they had around what I just talked about? Sister in the front, thank you for any, any key takeaway or? Um, I had some teachers yesterday asking about the correlation between the diagnostic score mid-year and the EOG. Mm -hmm. um, so I was happy to see that knowing that I would be able to take that back. Yep, great. Um, any questions that people have? So I know there's one over there around. So you talked about the achievement level descriptors where we created those achievement level descriptors based upon the standards. What standards were they? Right. So what we actually did um, in designing this, we actually abstracted from the standards. So we actually look at the precursors to the new standards. So the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics had a set of standards that they put together. 
those standards became part of like North Carolina, Common Core, many other states. So rather than just assess a specific standard, what we decided to do instead is let's take a look at the skill. Let's measure the skill instead. And that's what all our items are doing. Right. Um, so we are measuring where kids are relative to the skills. And that way, it doesn't really matter what grade level a standard, that skill happens to be within a grade level. It just matters, matters, matters where kids should be. So we're not just looking at North Carolina standards within iReady. We're looking at many others, all the standards. If you want to know how kids are performing relative to your standards, you have a North Carolina standards report that lets you know whether they have a green or white check based upon that. So what we're doing is for those skills associated with a standard at a particular grade level, did they achieve that skill in the test? Ultimately, it's more important for us to pay attention to the outputs not the inputs. So what I mean by that is I know part of the process of trusting the data is understanding the question that goes on the test. But if we just devote all our energy towards that and don't focus on what to do with the data, it's not going to serve us very well. So back to my medical analogy, right? Um, I don't ask the doctor how a blood pressure monitor works. I don't question the fact that is that cuff the right size for my arm? I just focus more on the fact that he tells me my blood pressure is high and I'm going to do something about it. However, if I spend all my energy thinking about, is that the right cuff size? Maybe I do, right? But if that's the right cuff size, did you measure it correctly? If I have high blood pressure, I got to focus on that and not worry so much about the input part of it, right? So if I can get our teachers to just focus in on what to do about the data, not worry so much about, is it the right standards that we're assessing? Is it the right grade level? It's telling you that these kids are below in this area. Let's do something about it as opposed to seeing whether or not, you know, we measured properly. Um, I know that's just an odd analogy, but that's something that came to mind yesterday um, when I was talking at one district. But I think it kind of resonates with them. Um, so how do I look at the data? So when I think about looking at the data, I like to think of it from a seasonal perspective. I, um, I know it's hard to think of a season. Like, I, I live in Toronto, so see, like winter for me is like snow. I don't really see any snow down here. But um, in the fall, what we really want to do is think about it from a perspective of what's my strengths and my opportunities for growth. In the winter, what are the key actions I need to take before the end of the year? Because the state test is coming up very quickly. And in the spring, what I want to do is I want to do a retrospective. I want to look backwards to see how we did. Right. So in the fall, what I would do is I would identify the kids who may need intervention. So the way I would do that is I would go into iReady. <coughs> I would look at the diagnostic results report and using a beginning of year view, where beginning of year means that a student is um, in the yellow or the, in the green if they are less than one level below where they are. I mean, so I'll say it in a different way. If I'm teaching third grade and I have a student who's scoring grade two, they're still in the green. If they're scoring grade two or early three, mid three or late three, they're in the green. Why do I consider that to be okay? It's because I haven't taught them anything at a third grade level. So I would not identify a student needing intervention if they are scoring grade two at the beginning of the year in third grade. I haven't taught them anything at the third grade level. However, if they're scoring like grade one or kindergarten, yes, maybe I want to identify those students for some sort of MTS or RTI program, right? Um, I want to look at my class data to identify where are we strong? What domains are we relatively strong in? And then the opposite is true. Like what domains are my students struggling in? So back to the notion of what those districts do in terms of those high flyers, they look at this data within the class across the grade level and they get together in a PLC and they identify, hey, what grade level are you strong in? What grade levels are you weak in? What domains? And let's think about what we're going to do about it. Because if we see that we're all below level in third grade numbers in operation, let's talk about what we can do to improve that. Okay. Um, the other thing I talked about is these data chats. So on iReady Central, you've even gone there, we have these data chat protocols, but we have them for principals to have data chats with teachers. Um, we have data chat forms for district level folks to have conversations with principals about their data. And then we have these data chats um, for students as well. But we also have people, we have a data, pro data pr uh, protocol activity to help you look through your data. 
okay? We have data chats for students as well. So if you don't do this, if you haven't started this practice, I strongly recommend um, having students have a data chat with their kids um, before and after their diagnostic. So why do I want to do it beforehand? Right? Um, the reason why I want to do it beforehand is because we want kids to get the best data possible. Do you mind if I order this cue card? Thanks. So one of the practices that one of these districts that I've worked, I've seen, I've gone through before um, do is they actually have kids reflect upon how they did on their, their previous diagnostic before they take the next one. So the like Clark County is out, like, outside Las Vegas. And this is what they do with all this, like a couple of schools do this with all the kids. Before the diagnostic, they ask the students to look at how they did previously. So let's say I'm doing my second diagnostic and my first diagnostic score is 500. So they would write down my first diagnostic score is 500. And then they would have a data chat. So students like you normally grow 20 scale score points over the course of a year. We're taking that second diagnostic halfway through the year. So do you think you grew more or less than half? And have kids reflect upon all the learning that they've done so far. And if you say that, I think I grew more than half. So what's a good goal for you? What goal do you want to set for yourself? So let's say it's 511. So they would write on the cue card, my goal is 511. They know that they started at 500. They take that cue card and they put it next to the computer as the student takes that second diagnostic or any the next diagnostic. And making that goal very visible helps and they notice the following. Thank you. Um, students are not rushing as much anymore. A lot of those kids are not getting that score reversal where the second diagnostic is lower than the first. And many students are achieving that 511, the goal that they are set for themselves. And it's um, not just Clark County. I see this in many other places, but it is very much in line with a lot of the broader research that we've seen. So anyone familiar with John Hattie's work around visible thinking? Right. So what strategy has the greatest effect size? Self-efficacy, right? Or student expectations. He keeps changing the terminology, but in essence, it's the same thing, right? If we can get kids to set goals for themselves, reflect upon the learning, develop that belief, they are actually going to work towards achieving that goal. And by going through that simple process of just writing down how they did, what their goal is, and making it visible as they take that second diagnostic, it helps us get better data. Right. So I know that it's a practice that I'm starting to push or recommend to most districts, but it's a great way to make sure that we get the best data possible. Right. And data chats is one way to do so. Um, the other thing with data chats, we actually get kids to think about what goals they want to work on. Right. Um, and then there are many other practices in aggregating those goals into a class or school level, um, sharing the results with parents to increase the buy-in. So if you haven't seen that four families report, you can use that in conjunction with the student's diagnostic results as part of um, parent-teacher conferences, right? Being able to share with them what their students' data, their data chats, what goals they've set for themselves, and not just they're using the actual evidence, the actual data to do the so. I know that um, normally, I would, so for those who are watching this later on, the principals, you can also have a data chat with every single student. Right. So in the schools like Miami, um, we're working on a case study right now around what principal is doing. But all those schools that got really good um, outcomes, they have data chats with every single student. So this is what they do. They have um, media centers or libraries and every single class in the elementary schools generally have some sort of library period. So every single um, student after um, the teacher has had the data chat with the students, the principal will sit themselves in the library. And during that library period, they will rotate um, and talk with a, like a one minute conversation with every single student. And they'll say, so how did you do an I ready? What's your goal? Where are you placing? What's, what's, what's your goal? What are you going to work on next? That's great. How did you do an I ready? What goal did you What goals do you have? Where do you want to be? What are you going to work on next? And they move on with every single student. And within that library period, they can actually have a data chat with every single student. And in talking with those principals in Miami, what they say is that it's dramatically changed their relationship with their students. In the past, the principals, the only time they see the principals is when they're in trouble. Now they're seeing that dynamic shift. They're seeing the fact that these principals really care about how am I doing in school. Right? They ask me about my goals, what I'm going to work on. And when the principal goes back and checks in with them, they can then tell them the progress that they're making. 
So as you know, a lot of what's, you know, the things that we're getting results is relationships. And this is one way to have with that relationship with the students um, in helping them understand what their goal is. And just going through that data chat process is one way to do so. Okay. Um, in the winter time where we are now, slightly colder, um, I really want to care about what is the grade level I'm most concerned about. I don't have time to look at every single grade. I want to focus on one grade. I want to focus within that grade. What domain do I need to focus in on? Because if third grade algebra and algebraic thinking is an area that we have not grown in or a lowest performing one, I got to do something about it, right? I want to figure out which students have low growth. And I want to figure out which students are my bubble kids. I, I know it's not a thing that we will always talk about, but ultimately that's a practice we all engage in. Who are the kids who are right at the cusp? And if I can work with those kids, maybe I can get them over the bar, right? So in math or in reading, who are the kids who are almost at early grade level? If I can find those kids, target them, maybe I can get them to proficiency, right? So we're going to go through an exercise in, um, right now where if you haven't logged in iReady, can you log in? Um, before you do that, let me talk about spring. So before, at the end of the year, you still want to look at your data. You want to look at which grades from a broad district perspe school perspective have shown the most amount of growth, which grades could improve, right? Which grade of, which, of the grade that did not improve very much, what domain do I need to focus in on? Because I have two problems. If fourth grade, um, if my students in leaving fourth grade did not grow very much in vocabulary, I have an issue. I have two issues. Those fourth graders are now my fifth graders who have a deficit in vocabulary. And if I know that, I can tell that to the next grade, mix the teacher in fifth grade, and maybe you can plan some sort of vocabulary activity with those kids. Maybe I can send those students home with additional reading to help them drive their vocabulary. And then I can also take a look at what am I doing in fourth grade vocabulary that's not getting the growth that I'm looking for. Right. So being able to look at the data from a retrospective perspective allows me to go off and do more planning in the summer. Right. So let's talk about uh, winter, back to my key actions. So it's going to be awkward, so I'm going to have to stand over there to look at the computer. Um, but what we're going to do is we want you to log in and do your own needs analysis. So in identifying your need, um, we have a guide, which I won't send to you, but what you want to do is you want to log in and look at your school diagnostic results and just pick a subject. So let's, um, as of, who wants to look at math? Yeah. Math. You're looking at math because I think reading you only have like a subset of kids. <laughs> so look at math. Um, this is your results across the grade across the district in terms of math. You are looking at a end of year view. So what you're doing with the cue cards, right, is you're gonna pick one color and identify where are you better than the district within a grade level? Where are you performing worse than the district? So choose one color to be positive, another color could be lower. And if you need more of a particular color, let us know, right? But if you're, if you're look, so pick a grade level, it doesn't matter any grade, just any grade. And if you are looking at third grade, if you have more than 22% of your students in the green, right? Um, you can, you are doing about better than them. So I know that some of you are not that familiar with the report. So I'll walk, I'll walk over here and I'll show you how to do, how to navigate and look at that. Okay. So I'm going to log into iReady uh, and I may need some help from Teresa to do so. Uh, Yeah, can, yes. Oh, so if someone can log into your district records. Oh, I guess. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So we're going to walk you through and take a look at the report. So just go into iReady under the, under the reports tab, click on um, reports. So we'll, we'll wait for to do this. So we're going to reports. Um, we're going to go to the district school report and we're going to look at diagnostic results for math. 
we're going to change the end of this view to end of year so that we're all consistent. We're going to look at the diagnostic results for, based upon the uh, window two, because that's the most recent one. Right. And then I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to change it from placement um, results by school. I'm going to change the results by grade. So this is what you're doing yourself. So you can see what, how you are doing relative to the district. So if I scroll down a bit more, you can see how you're doing. So if, you're, if your focus is third grade and you have more kids in the green than 22%, take a card and write down math third grade on it. If you're below in that area, write down, uh, take the other card, whatever the color happens to be, and do that. Okay? Yes. I can. That's why. I, that's what the screenshot. So I took a screenshot of this of this graph. Right. So the idea behind it. So I, I don't. I'm, I'm not sure I'm running out of time, but but you see the idea here, right? So what I want to do with my teachers is find how are we doing relative to each other, because ultimately what I would want you to do is the following. Um, Take a look at the gray that you're most concerned with. And the next thing that you can do is, if you don't mind going back to the top, um, and instead of looking at it from a um, placement summary, uh, what I want to do is I want to look at prior diagnostic and show diagnostic one. So what this is showing me now is how are we changing over time? So diagnostic two is what you just finished. I think some kids are still taking it. Diagnostic one is from the fall. And then if I were to scroll down, what this is going to let me know is when you look at your own grades, not only are you going to compare yourself against the district, you may want to compare yourself against the change, the delta between um, window two and window one. So in second grade, across the district, there was a 17 percentage point increase. So what you want to look at is two things. Is there a particular grade that's not growing very much, right? Or are you below the district in any particular area? Or were you above the district, right? We want to celebrate that as well. So being able to look at these differences helps me identify a particular grade that I really want to target. The next thing that I've done is if I want to do is I want to look at the domain information. So if I scroll back up, if you actually go to switch table view and click on needs analysis by domain, this gives me the ability now to take a look at how am I doing across the, the different domains in math. So this, you have to look at this um, in the opposite manner. What you would do is you would go off and identify um, how many kids have a smaller number? So this is telling you um, how many kids are in the yellow or the red, or what percentage of students are yellow and the red, right? Uh, so because we use the end of your view, if you're not scoring mid or higher, you would show up in here. So what I'm really looking at from this perspective is if for the grade that's not growing very much or the grade where I am below the district, Let's take a look at a particular domain. Am I doing better than the district in one of these areas? And I want to celebrate that. Am I doing worse than the district in one of these areas? Maybe that's where I would target my efforts. So we talked about looking at identifying the grade and we talked about identifying the domains that I need to focus in on. Right. So you can do it from two perspectives. Do I have um, more than 66 percent of the kids or let's see, do I have more than 74 um, percent of the students who are below in numbers and operation at a first grade level? Right. So if you don't, um, then this is where you want to then you want to celebrate that because you're doing better than the district. So this is a little bit confusing. You got to look at it from the opposite perspective. If you have numbers lower than this, you're doing really well. If you have numbers bigger than this, we need to help. We need to focus on that area. Okay. So if you don't mind, thank you. Um, so what I would do next is the following. So the cue cards I had things is designed such that you would be able to. Oh no, wrong one. <laughs> ultimately come down to this, right? We want you to identify the strengths and your opportunities for growth. So 
those cue cards they gave you is just more of like a prop. But you want to, you may want to do the exact same thing with the teachers, right? Identify what grade levels we're doing relatively well in relative to the district or the class or the school. Identify that and where are you below? And just basically writing one cue card per like positive or negative. Right. And by doing so, what I know what I've done in other places when I had a bit more time is I actually get people together after they look at their domain information to figure out where they're surprised or what confirmed their thoughts. And then they would look at their domains and then they would see, hey, we're doing even though we're doing really well in third grade, right? We still need to improve in algebra and operation and um, geometry. Let me find somebody else who's has the opposite of this card, right? Someone who is doing better, who are doing better than I am in these areas, or I want to have someone who has an orange color card or a different color card, who is doing not as well in third grade, and collaborate with one another. So the idea is to try and identify people that we can talk to. Who are the ones that we can exchange ideas with around because they seem to be doing better in third grade math than I am. Right. They, however, even though I'm doing well in third grade math, there's still areas I need to improve on in this area. So I may find other people with a green card and say, hey, who did better than the district in geometry? What are you doing in geometry? How are you teaching some of those skills? What strategies did you use? Are there specific standards that you think that you think kids are struggling with? So this is just one exercise you can go through with your teachers in being able to look at your data in a PLC setting to identify uh, where we need to focus. Because there's not a lot of time. We can't focus on every single grade. Let's look at the grade that has the least amount of um, not doing well relative to the, to the district. Let's look at the domain and really focus our efforts there, right? So what I'll do is I will send you these slides afterwards. This is, I took these, um, this image. So all I did is I, it, basically what you saw previously, I just cut out the middle column. So this is telling you across the district how you are doing in grades K through eight in the various domains in uh, math. So if you have numbers lower than this, you are doing well. If you have numbers bigger than this, not so good. But ultimately, it comes down to identifying that problem of practice. What is the grade level? What is the domain I need to pay, pay attention to? Once I've isolated that, what about third grade numbers in operation do I need to focus in on? Right? Who did better than me? Who did, which classroom did a better job than I did in that? Let's collaborate and share ideas. Are there standards I need to reteach or preteach? Right? Any questions about this? Um, I'm going to skip through, I'll come back to the instructional planning piece. So in front of you is that document, right? That two page document determining growth and performance. So what we want to do is we want to go and look at this document and identify where my kids are. So just go and go into iReady and select a class. Okay. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to go into iReady. I'm going to look at my diagnostic growth report. Uh, can you log again? So we're just going to do the diagnostic growth report for a class. Any class. Right. Yes, any class. So, so what you're going to do is you're going to go into your own data. You're going to run the diagnostic growth report um, for your a class, right? And because this is an exercise we want you to bring back to your teachers. So any class, select any diagnostic growth in math, select a school, doesn't matter what school, you know them better, um, any teacher or any grade level, you can, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to change the diagnostic comparison. Um, okay, so let's go with a, like an upper, like fifth grade or something like that. Okay, perfect. So we're going to change the academic comparison. Year to date is fine, or I can do it from a perspective of um, diagnostic two. It should be the same, just in case. So what this is telling me from my class perspective is that this class is actually growing relatively well. They are at 75% progress. That means for what we're doing is, uh, how many kids are in this class? I think there's a number 
17. Of those 17 students, what we've done is we've calculated their progress towards typical growth. And we looked at the middle student, number eight or nine. Um, and what we were doing is we're looking at how much progress that middle student has made, and it's 75% of their goal. So they're doing relatively well. Half the kids got more than 75, half the kids got less than that. If I want to know the exact numbers, if I click on the plus next to the progress distribution, this will tell me where, how we're doing. So there's five kids who've already achieved the goal. Five students are 60 to 79%. So you know, there's 11 kids who are doing really well. What I need to do as a teacher is target these two, these, these two groups. The two kids who are less than 19 and the four kids who are 20 to 39. So I'm going to scroll down a bit more. <laughs> if you don't mind, if you go to um, the current placement and scale score and click on one of the arrows to just like sort this, you may have to scroll. Yeah, so just sort the, this column. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you. So what I'm doing right now is remember my quadrant graph? So right now in the document in front of you, look at the left-hand column, quadrants two and th three. These are all the students who have low performance. The students who have low performance would be, so this is a fourth grade class. They're working at a first, second grade level. So these kids have low performance. However, I would say that Tyron has high growth. So I would write down Tyrone, Tyron in quadrant two. Right. I would write down um, Katzes as quadrant three, low growth, low proficiency. Eli, quadrant three. Um, Yoramani, um, quadrant two. Natal Natalia, um, quadrant three. So all I'm doing is I'm just looking at this report. I'm sorting by the placement, the most recent placement, because that tells me how they're doing right now. I'm looking at their progress towards typical growth. Anything above 50%, I would consider that child to be high growth. Once again, I don't know exactly when you took your second diagnostic, but I'm assuming I use the 50% of the mark because generally most people take it halfway through the year, right? And if you don't mind scrolling all the way down, Students like, so you can consider some of these kids who are early, because that's, or, or just only look at the green. So I would say students like um, JL, right? He is considered quadrant one. He has um, high growth, high proficiency, right? High performance. And then I may consider like someone like um, Janaya, um, quadrant one four, right? High proficiency, low growth. But you see how what we're trying to do here? We want you to look at the data from that two by two perspective. And the next thing that we want to do is the following. We want you to identify one quadrant that you're going to pay attention to from now until the end of the year. So if you flip to the next document, next page, what we want you to do is to write out, so pick one of these quadrants. And there's no right or wrong answer. You can either pick the quadrant with the most number of kids. You could pick quadrant three, those students who are low proficiency, low growth. You could pick quadrant two. I want to double down and making sure that these kids who have high growth, they maintain that from the rest of the year. It's ultimately up to you to decide what you want to focus on. But I would generally recommend as a school, have some sort of consistency, right? So what I would do is, let's say I'm going to focus on my students who are quadrant um, three, right? So I'm going to go back up to the top, and I'm going to look at um, Eli. So if I click on, click on Eli's name, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch from diagnostic growth to the diagnostic results. So remember, if you look at the document, it says, what, is this, what does this tell you? So I'm writing down Eli's name, and what's the next column over? It says, what does it say? lowest performing domains, right? So if I scroll down, end of your view. Either way, we'll raise the side, end of your view. So I'm gonna scroll down. So the question in the document in front of you says, what is Eli's two lowest performing domains? So I would say Eli's lowest performing domain is numbers and operation and algebra, I can think of geometry. If I recall, um, fourth grade, I don't know your state test, but generally there's a lot of algebraic thinking at a fourth grade level. 
So maybe I would focus on these two lowest performing domains. So I would write down Eli, lowest performing domain is numbers and operation grade two, algebra and algebraic thinking grade two. Right? I'm going to go, since I'm here, I'm going to go all the way to the right hand column. And what does it say? Identify a couple of next steps. So let's click on next, next numbers and operation. I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to work with Eli. I'm going to sit down with him. I'm going to think about my other students and pick a couple of these skills that I'm going to work, focus in on from now until the end of the year. So I've identified my two lowest performance domains. I'm picking a couple of skills that I'm going to work on and putting it down in this document. Right? So I did that for numbers and operation. I can do the exact same thing for um, algebra and algebraic thinking. But what I'm doing now is I'm targeting a group of kids to work on. These are the kids who may be low growth, low proficiency. It could be whatever you decide. I'm identifying their lowest performing domains and what skills I'm going to work on. The other columns talks about like other information that we have about those students. And we want to look at that information. Um, the other thing that I want to look at is I'm going to see Eli's uh, online instruction. So if I go back to the top <coughs> and I'm going to change my results to online instruction, I want to see how Eli is doing in online instruction. So he's doing relatively well, right? So if I click on the plus next to activity overview, so he is um, passing his lessons relatively high, right, 94%. However, I do see a bit of a challenge over here. So what I noticed in terms of his time on task is the number of minutes that he's spending on iReady. Not a lot. Like, so eight minutes so far this week, five minutes last week. Once again, I don't know what happened last week, right? But as a teacher, I would know whether or not students, that Eli is getting the right amount of time. So I may want to go off and prioritize Eli's time to make sure that he's getting at least the 30 minutes of iReady per week. And then I want to make sure that he is maintaining that high pass rate. So this is why I'm going into that document and looking at their online instruction to do that. So Eli, I now have a plan. My plan is to make sure that Eli spends a bit more time on iReady. I know what lessons he's working on because I can scroll down um, and this is telling me what our lessons are coming up for him. If any of these lessons are associated with what I'm working with him next, I can um, double down on it, right? But I'm now looking at what, what's going on with Eli because he has low proficiency, low growth. If I can help him achieve some of these skills, those next steps, he's very likely to grow more, right? And if I can get him to complete, uh, increase his time on task, he's going to get uh, complete enough lessons to make some progress. Any questions about this activity? This is something that would be great for you guys to bring back to your schools. And that if we have PD, we can work with you on that as well. Okay. Um, so there's one last, two last things I want to do. So one thing as an aggregate you may want to go and look at um, is going back to the activities, right? Instruction, not instructional usage, but looking at from a perspective of instructional planning. So you, want to, you may want to go and look at your own school's um, instructional grouping report. So we're going to go back to instructional grouping in iReady. Um, so I'm just going to go back to close on this, go to the very top, look at reports. I'm going to look at instructional groupings for a school or district for a school. Oh. So go back one, and we're going to look at it from a school perspective. This is the class. Yep. So school instructional groupings, right? And what I really want to pay attention to is I want to know from a fourth grade perspective, where are most of my kids falling? Because remember I talked about that, what um, Tillman Elementary does? They will regroup an entire grade level. So what they will do is they are doing two things. So if you click on, on diagnostic window and change it from two, two to one, <laughs> what I want to look at is I want to see the progress that we're making. Are we moving kids from group one to group two to group three, group four, and where are we stalling out? So click on, so I have 36, 44, and so on. Change to diagnostic two. So in looking at this, it seems to be that we have a lot of kids still in group two. Some of the kids move from two to one to two, but let's take a look at great group two. And what I may want to do now is if this is the area that we're not making a lot of progress, I have 30 something, 33 kids here. I can't work with, with all 33 kids, 
But what I can do is I can sort them within a particular domain. So group two, you are below levels in numbers and operation and algebra, algebra and algebraic thinking. So what I can then do is if I group my kids, I'd like to sort by this domain. Maybe I will work with all the kids like Yale, Michaela, uh, Melissa, and so on. And I just work with all the kids in grade three. And I regroup them that way. And if I scroll down further, oh, within that, sorry, uh, scroll down within this bar, yep. All the kids who are early, that's another group. So I've gone from 33 kids, I've now broken them to like 16, 17. I don't know what the actual numbers happens to be. But I'm now trying to regroup my kids based upon how they're performing within the domains. And then I can look at the instructional priorities and pick some of them to focus in on. So here's another way for me to get my grade level teams together. We recognize that a particular domain is an area of need for concern for us because we're not making progress for those group two kids. Let's separate them out a little bit more to work with the kids who are really far below versus a little bit below in that domain and really focus on some of these instructional skills. Right. So all we're really trying to do is just look at the data, look at the outputs. What's the outputs telling us? What should we focus in on? Right, and do something about it. And if you don't mind going to the slides, the, the last exercise I'll go have you guys go through is this. Um, so basically, what the groups are, are they making group progress on kind of groups, and then um, how to adjust it? We do went through this pro activity of looking at the um, two by two. Um, the last thing that I know that so actually this is not going to help you that much. You don't have reading data, right? So ignore it. However, if you had reading data, right, um, what you could do is you can identify the kids who may need summer school early enough. Because if I look, go back to my um, crosswalk, any student who is in third grade who is not at, like, who are not close to 530, if I take a look at their typical growth and I add their current score plus typical growth and it doesn't get me to 530, those are the kids I know are at risk of not being proficient, right? Level three on EOG. And if they're not level three on EOG in the state of North Carolina, I think we have to do, put them in summer school or retain them. But I have data now that tells me which kids are likely to be enough, grow enough to be in this category. And if I have some kids in, who are like in level one, have a scale score like 470 or 480, right? unless they grow a lot, they may not get to this like 530 number. And then those are the kids, maybe they start a portfolio for those students, right? I'd rather do this now than have to scramble at the end of the year when I realize that the student is at level, not level three. So this is another way of looking at data. Not, I don't think you have any, you know, some reading data, but not a lot. Right? So I think I'm at time. Um, Thank you very much for your um, opportunity to present to you today. Let me know if you have any questions and I'll make these slides available to you. I do want to close with one quote. Uh, this is back from the book, To the End of Average. Once again, if you haven't seen the TED Talk, I highly recommend it. Um, so right now, um, we believe in the myth of average. We believe that opportunity means providing equal access to standardized ex educational experiences. If we give all kids the same thing, we should be fine. Right? However, since nobody's actually average, it's obvious that equal access to the same resources is not, en not enough to provide equal opportunity. It's just another way for us to think about equity, right? Being able to provide kids with what they need in order to be successful, the only way to, for us to know what they need is to look at the data to tell us how they're performing and what they should be working on next or what they're ready to learn next, right? Um, so thanks. Here's my email address in case you need to contact me, right? Thank you. Thank you.